so I'm going to bring us all back home. People keep asking me whether the U.S. is going to experience a second civil war. And um, a few years ago, I would have said absolutely not. I've been studying civil wars for decades, and the U.S., until recently, had none of the factors associated with the outbreak of civil war. So I didn't think that Americans would fight each other again. That's changed. So um, we now know, um, we now know uh, the risk factors that are associated with the outbreak of civil war. And in, in particular, there are two big risk factors that exist, and I'm going to talk about them in a second. But both of those factors are emerging in the United States and have been emerging in the United States since 2016, and they're emerging surprisingly rapidly. So for the very first time, I'm beginning to worry. And I do think there is some possibility that the U.S. might be heading yet again to another civil war. And I'm going to tell you why. Um, there are two things that we now know about civil wars, two big things. The first is that civil wars are increasing, and they have been increasing since the end of World War II. What this figure shows you in light blue is the number of civil wars every year. Um, the dark blue is the number of extra systemic, or what we call colonial wars, and the yellow, which has all but disappeared, is the number of interstate wars. So what you see here is that civil wars have fairly consistently increased since 1946. They did dip in the 1990s, but since the early 2000s, they have reversed and they've been increasing over time. This graph only goes to 2016, but if you extended the data to 2017 and 2018, you would see that it has continued to rise, and in fact, 2018 was the most violent uh, year in terms of civil wars since the end of the Cold War. So civil wars is not becoming a smaller problem over time. In fact, it's becoming a bigger problem. And those of us who study it do not think it's going to go away anytime soon. The second thing we know are what the risk factors are for civil war. This building is a picture of um, uh, a building just out of outside of Washington, D.C. I'm a member of a task force. That task force is called the Political Instability Task Force. It's funded by the Department of Defense, and twice a year we meet in this building. And um, I Googled, actually, when I was preparing this talk last week, I was Googling um, on the Internet to see what people know about the Political Instability Task Force. It's been around for over 20 years, and I found some really interesting uh, uh, articles. But my favorite quote was this, um, that PITF, which is what we call ourselves, is a clairvoyant squad of social science brainiacs charged with churning global political data into global instability forecasts. And this is the funny image that I found about what a brainiac looks like. Uh, so it, it kind of gets, we're not brainiacs, um, but our task, our job really is to create models that are able to predict um, the best that we can where and when countries are going to experience political instability and civil war. Um, and it turns out that our model is actually not very complex and that there's two factors in particular um, that um, are, that dominate, dominate um, the model. Um, and the first is um, what we call transitions to and from democracy. So most people um, believe that democratization is a good thing, and it is a good thing. The world would be a better place if all all countries were mature democracies. Um, those countries, mature democracies, tend to be richer, more prosperous. Their citizens live longer. They also tend not to fight other countries. They're more peaceful. So when um, governments around the world advocate for more democracies, we tend to think that's a good thing. The problem is countries almost never go from autocracy to democracy without some uh, unstable and violent period in between. So what this figure shows you um, is the annual likelihood of what we call an instability event <coughs> um, depending on the type of political regime is in, that's in power. And <coughs> what you see here 
is that full democracies, those which we categorize on the right-hand side, there we use a number system to categorize them, but full democracies are the least unstable, the least violent-prone countries. After full democracies, the most stable, most peaceful countries are actually on the opposite end. They are countries like North Korea and Saudi Arabia and Uzbekistan. We might, our, many people assume that those countries are actually particularly prone to civil war. They are not. Why? They happen to have, often have very, very effective arms of political repression. It's really hard to rebel in those countries. Where we see most of the violence and the countries that experience most instability and most civil war are the ones in the middle. The ones that are neither fully democratic nor fully autocratic. There's something in between. And in fact, what's interesting about this is you don't tend to get civil war and instability in the early phases of democratization. You actually tend to get it when it, they're almost, they've almost reached reach democracy. And so one of the perhaps unknown tragedies, or maybe perhaps one of the surprises that most people and most policymakers do not know, is that by pushing for democracy in countries that had been autocracies, you were oftentimes inadvertently and unconsciously pushing those countries through a transition period in which they are at higher risk of civil war. Okay, I'm gonna get back to how this relates to the United States. It also happens to be that if you're moving down this scale, if you're moving from full democracy down towards this middle zone, you are also at higher risk of civil war. Um, and that's the trend that we have been seeing since the beginning of the 2000s. We are in a period of democratic decline, not just here in the United States, but in other full democracies around the world. Okay, so that's the first thing that we know. The second thing that we know is that if you are one of these pseudo-democracies, or you're in this middle zone, and your population also happens to be polarized, your society is divided along ethnic, religious, racial, or class lines, those are the countries that are most likely to experience civil war. And so it's this combination of being a pseudo-democracy, or some people, Fareed Zakaria likes to call them illiberal democracy, in societies that are deeply divided. Those are the countries where you really have to begin to worry. And in Washington, D.C., when we were talking about, we have a map up and we're looking around the world where, where we do think violence is likely to break out, those are the countries that we are looking at. Okay. This is where we come back home and we think about the United States. Both of these factors are increasing in the United States. Now, for years and years and years, the United States was classified as a positive 10. You don't need to know what that means, but that means that you are in the most mature, the most ideal type of liberal democracy. Switzerland, Sweden, Denmark, Canada, Australia, those are all categorized as plus 10 countries. And until 2016, that's where the United States was. In 2016, the U.S. was downgraded to what's what was called a flawed democracy. And it is now in the same category as countries like Chile, Argentina, Uruguay, and South Africa. So our democracies on a host of different measure, our democracy on a host of different measures is weakening. Our institutions are weakening. And then in terms of polarization, we all know that the United States has become more divided over time. If you look, for example, at the voting record of Republicans in Congress, their voting record has shifted dramatically to the right. If you look at the voting record of Democrats in Congress, their voting record has shifted to the left. It's happening on both parties. Neither party is particularly willing to compromise. This is the definition that we use for polarization. 
And then this is a really good quote by a former senator. Um, and I think he did aptly uh, capture that, that tribalism is increasing in our country. He feared that it was potentially tearing it apart. So on both of these factors that we know has increased the risk of civil war in other countries around the world over time, both of these factors we're seeing um, um, increase here in the United States. So what has been the result? We know that violence has also increased here in the United States. Now, the Fund for Peace is an NGO that measures uh, <coughs> of various things, um, mostly having to do with levels of violence. Um, and last year in 2018, it put the United States on its list of most worsened countries for political violence. Um, we know that the United States last year dropped more than any other country in the world on the global peace index. Um, it was at uh, uh, 103rd place and it's now at 114th place. Um, we know that there is an increase in every form of political violence since 2008. There's been a rise in mass shootings. There's been a 60% increase in small-scale attacks um, on U.S. citizens. We know that there's been a rise in targeted assassinations of politicians and their supporters. And then finally, we do know that the number of militia groups in this country has increased, especially since 2010, um, and it's estimated that there are now approximately 500 militia groups in the country. Most of those, most of those militia groups are right-wing militia groups. That is a change. It used to be prior. Um, uh, if you think back to the 1970s and the 1980s, most of the militia groups in this country, and there, were, there was a much smaller number of them, were left-leaning. Think about the environmental uh, groups or Greenpeace. Um, and today, that's changed. Almost all of the growth has come um, in terms of right-wing groups. So, does this mean that I think we're going to have civil war in this country? No. Even the countries that have all of the risk factors, keep in mind that civil wars are still rare. Um, civil wars are rare events. But it does mean that we have to be conscious that we are going down a path that is potentially dangerous um, and that we should be aware of this. Um, and I want to end by basically putting the impetus, impetus on us moving forward. We as citizens have been the ones who are allowing our politicians to weaken our institutions, to weaken our democratic norms. We have been the ones that have allowed income inequality to happen, that have <clears throat> allowed fear mongering to take place. We have been the ones who are allowing companies like Facebook to recruit extremists. Um, one of the things I ask you to do is when you leave here, go on Facebook and Google extremist group or white nationalist group or the three percenters. Facebook is the primary means by which these militia groups are recruiting supporters. Um, so it's our own companies that are aiding, aiding this process. We are the ones that are allowing for the proliferation of guns. And so all of these things are leading to the conditions that potentially put our society and our country at greater risk of civil war. So I guess I'm going to end this by saying if <coughs> we want to avoid civil war, we're the ones that have to take responsibility for it. We're the ones who have to hold our politicians accountable and press them to en enact policies that will reverse reverse the democratic decline that we've seen, that will reverse the proliferation of guns that we've seen, that will reverse the use of, of uh, hateful speech and incendiary speech to continue to drive a wedge uh, between us. And if we ignore these trends, if we don't hold our politicians accountable, um, we could be in a position where we do see increased political violence and we might see um, uh, another civil war. Thank you.